thank you all for being here. The great advantage of my current time zone is that I'm just freshly awake uh, while your work day ends, so I'm fit and there. So let me share my screen and begin my talk. So um, I hope you all see my screen. Um, let me open the chat. That's good. We can see. Yep. Okay, I have the chat open. So if you have um, questions at the same time, it should be able to work. I have that on the second screen. So um, then it should. So um, I'm personally dealing since a longer while with time series forecasts. Um, and in general, this time series analysis uh, is a thing that, uh, let's say, hunts me from my early days of engineering. Let me say a few things, what, what I do with my life and why I do that and why I believe this brings value to the world. Um, I'm basically a, a software engineer um, throughout uh, my career. So I, I deal with a lot of data uh, techniques. I started originally with data warehouse, but I'm still always on the engineering side because I believe that um, there are data solutions where you need to combine um, great data analysis with great software engineering. So I'm really glad that there are now a lot of big data scenarios uh, that enable me to, to combine that at the customer side. Um, I believe that there will be in the future data marketplaces. That's something that I personally believe in. And I believe that we can use a lot of big data technique to make the globe more sustainable, save more resources, reroute resources, and let's say save a little bit of CO2 to maybe hopefully stop global warming, or I mean, to slow it down, to be more, be more resource efficient. So when I talk about sustainability, let's talk about public transport. So um, occupancy in public transport is a very important thing because ultimately it boils down how, um, what we all use from government money that it's a leverage in optimal way. And when we see occupancy uh, in public transport, then um, we, we get a pattern like that, where we have the different times throughout the day, and then we can have the stations, we can have the lines. So, and then we can say, what and where is the density highest? And the key question that we have is, can we forecast this occupancy in public transport? And how do these patterns um, evolve? So in the traditional imagine learning approach, we take old data, so we would take the old occupancy, then we train a prediction model and say that is what it was yesterday, two weeks before, and so on and so forth. Then we train the stuff and we deploy the trained model that we maybe we trained in Jupyter notebooks, or maybe we used Spark and trained in then we then we have the trained model, we are really proud and we deploy it. And if we are really fancy, um, we would use a, a, um, a neuronal network or so what I would not recommend in public transport, but I will come to this, um, let's say, uh, challenges that are there. So let's look at the public transport example deeper. So that is uh, now the occupancy um, throughout the day. We have here a nice Monday, the people are all good, they go all to work between seven and eight. Then at nine, they are at where a work, they are all at their desk, and then we have a peak at um, 1300. What is really interesting because um, I still remember when I saw the data for the first time, I assumed that the peak would be at five or so, but no, these people right at 1300. This is pre COVID data. So all of that is not so fun anymore when we look at Saturday. Saturday, the, the scale magnitude is done down by a uh, factor 10. Um, the times shift when the most of the people ride. And there we have the 1600 spike. And at the evening, we have the people who go to restaurants or so. So when we would just do a normal training and we do not model different weekdays, we, we have a problem to do this forecast. So, and that is one essential thing that we need to talk about why that happens, how that happens, and what the implications are. Now, 
there is a solution for that. Um, when you when you open the uh, textbook of uh, data science for beginners, what to do? Okay, you take the training data, and then you take a seasonal trend, something like overlay data, like weather data. You say there is the weather responsible. You take the weekdays, and then you feed this into the ARIMA model. You do exponential smoothing. You use an LSTM and the the overlay trend data then adjusts your model and it allows you to do the forecast. However, there is a, a little problem with that when we look at the little effects of Corona. This is now uh, the London public transport and here we see um, how, yeah, how Corona was, was hitting it. So when one would now want to model this seasonal trends, this is not a seasonal trend. It's an unexpected event that had similar effects that may be a seasonal trend, but it's not something that we know in advance. So we cannot start training for something um, that we do not know. We do not know when governments are taking actions about uh, about corona we do not know when the when these things happen that the people then might not use public transport anymore we have no clue about that so we cannot just simply say we have an overlay here because that is not an overlay that's a fundamental change in behavior and this is what we call concept drift so Let's look at this data more, uh, more, um, let's uh, more deeper. And I, I like here this example of occupancy da data in, um, in public transport because what you see here is now down. You see public for uh, forecasts for uh, occupancy in public transport, um, and uh, the pink line is our forecast, and the and the um, blue line was uh, the real um, occupancy. So you see it's generally possible we did this forecast uh, then finally. But let me talk about what the problem with data was. So we have non-linear changes. So that means in the moment when an overlay change is non-linear, we cannot model a trend or so because there is no trend. It's not a clear trend. Oh, Lockdown conditions open, lockdown closed, more lockdown, lesser lockdown, this, uh, the hammer and the dance uh, scenario where the people are too, too much freedom, too less freedom, up and down. It's very, very hard to model. Plus seasonal changes like Christmas and so on. So the changes are unpredictable. They are non-linear. Data holes, yeah, that's, uh, that's something that people often forget that real data often has some kind of holes because the system has been down here, the counting was stopped. So we see between 2019-11 um, and 2019-12, um, there is just a hole in the data. There, there was no um, data recorded for, for days. And when we have these holes, uh, and we feed this into machine learning, then we get problems in, in forecasting because it's not consistent. And another thing is that we will not have the data quantity that we wish for, at least in, in this project we didn't have. So that means when we don't have the amount of data, then we cannot even learn such seasonal trends or we cannot even extrapolate them. So that then these changes just happen. There might be even a hole before. And the question is, how do we do that then? Last but not least, the data might need to be cleaned. Then we clean the data. And once you clean the data, um, that is also very nice in public transport. There is a bus, imagine a bus, and the bus gets reloaded at a certain stop and um, is then a new line. And when you want to do predictions, then you have the problem that this bus that is currently stopping at this stop is line seven. And after the stop, it's line five. And there might be really evil people remaining in the bus when the line changes. So when we count the entries and exits, then we have exits without entries. 
So when we clean that data, what does that mean for our machine learning? Does it mean that, that we ultimately learn how we clean the data in our machine learning model? Now, I mean, it, it sounds really trivial in, in, the first, in the first thing, but when you clean data and you apply machine learning later, you will run into the risk of learning the data cleaning, and that is not what you want. So uh, you need to find really methods to clean the data properly, to have the input data right. So that is the precondition, and then you can say, okay, can I forecast? What does that mean when I, when I think about that for our machine learning deployment? You have changing data features like corona, uh, uh, corona lockdowns. You have, in addition to that, um, holes in the data and all of the prior problems. So the models might not fit to the reality anymore. So they get worse over time. And maybe your algorithm also does not change anymore that you used for forecasting. So, <laughs> Deploying an algorithm once when you have this so-called concept drift is not working anymore because you need to redeploy it. So now you can think about to make a process that you go back to your Jupyter notebook that you do in the data lab and you try it out and you retrain and you do that. But how do you do that? Do you do that by gut instinct? Um, we do not believe that, that this is the solution. So we see that as a, as a fundamental problem, what you need to solve when you put models live and you need to consider that your model will change. But I talked now about this public transport things with Corona, but are there other concept drifts? So I give you complete other examples now that, uh, that you have an imagination. So. Image in winter and you measure and predict when you are going to use your smartphone. So we just want to predict when you get a WhatsApp message or something in your phone is changing that you might, most likely will pick it up and we want to predict the idle temperature of the phone. So we know um, when you get a message then the idle temperature will now most likely go higher because you will open it, you will do something. So let's just, just imagine you, we want to know what, what is the circumstance of your phone and what will be the idle temperature. So let's imagine that is a pretty good possible, but it will be a complete different temperature in the moment when it's winter outside, you have it in your cold hands, um, then if you are at a beach in Muscat or so, um, there it's warm weather, so the idle temperature will be higher. So simple outside conditions change your data. Typical concept drifts are when you go back to data warehousing, it's slowly changing dimensions. The slowly changing dimensions is something like you have a store and the, the head of the store is, is changing and then the store is performing better. And that is a typical thing. If you would predict the performance of a store, and it's depending on, on the head of the store, um, then this might be the reason why the store has a better performance. We call that in data warehousing, slowly changing dimensions in machine learning that will also have an implication. Um, inflation, we want to predict prices now. We have really great, great models for online, uh, for online shopping and now we have this nice thing, inflation. So that means we render um, a complete different kind of ball game of the inflation. And we do not even know how much it will change. We just know it is there. When you, you try to make market predictions with it then in the past with cryptocurrencies and, and predicted currency, currency uh, prices, then the market conditions, there are bull markets and bear markets. And when the people are, when you make your algorithms and the, let's say the polarity of the market changes, then it's a real problem. So you need to, to see how the public sentiment is changing. Um, public sentiment changes, exactly. That is what has an influence on the, uh, also when you, when you 
would now uh, investigate how people see Ukrainian products or so, there would be a sentiment change of society to perceive Ukrainian products much more likely better. So if you would now sell Ukrainian products in an online store, the people are more likely going to buy that. So that are things that change. Clearly in IoT and all sensors that run around, you have seasons. You do not only have seasons when you have um, a cargo carriage and the cargo carriage is ro rolling through different countries. Uh, let's just imagine you have um, a cargo carriage running, running from Romania to Spain. You have complete weather conditions. So when you have sensor readings, they will very, very much differ depending on the climate of the country. So you do not only have seasons like winter, no, no, you might also have something that is movable when you have IoT sensors. Last but not least, optimizing an online store. Another case is Christmas. When you model and predict your sales and you, and you do not model that there are possible changes like Christmas, that the calibrating factors are existing, then you might miss out on the Christmas season. Last but not least, um, really mean things are the really slowly happening things. So when you analyze old data, then global warming is not something that has a huge impact, but it's a, having a steady impact. So when you would build a model over years um, and you are lucky to get years of data and you would model uh, the development, um, then you will see that global warming has some effects. So how to solve that? You can solve that by do applying online learning. Online learning is the art to learn directly on a data stream. And there is um, a very nice a recommendable library. It's called Apache MOA. Um, Apache MOA is quite cutting edge from a research perspective. So the algorithms are normally developed at universities and then you can already use them. Um, and this online learning is completely, I would not say completely new, but you have uh, algorithms like active random forests and so on, where the tree changes during usage. So it's a bit experimental and it's new. Basically it works by splitting a data stream into training and forecast windows. And in order to apply that, you would now to train multiple algorithms to see which algorithm is working for your problem, then monitor the algorithm, then continuously retrain the model um, or let's say retraining is the wrong expression. You have to continuously train the model and then um, you can apply that. Before I bear you with abstract um, itemized list, let me do an example how we did uh, cryptocurrency uh, forecasts with um, the Apache MOA library. So we have a cryptocurrency like uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum. Then we measure the tweets, the amount of people who tweeted, the, the tweets per market cap, the exchange rate, bid and ask, and so on and so forth. And the public sentiment, do the people currently uh, perceive um, the the cryptocurrency thing positive or negative, and we mind that ultimately from all of the tweets from Twitter. There we said, okay, that's the historical situation. That is how it happened in the last month, how it happened in the last four weeks. And then we said, okay, we have a current situation. So the historical situation was leading to the current situation. So what we do with that, we train a model. And then we, uh, we test this model and on most recent data, so you have to imagine we 
do not take the situation of right now, we take the situation of two weeks ago and we test it, how would it have worked two weeks ago. And then we apply the same model for today. So we have different, let's say slices of windows of, of the past that we used to test the model in the past, in most recent situation, and then apply it to the um, present situation, but we need to train it continuously. Let me explain that a little bit better. I think uh, that's necessary at that point. If you have questions to that concretely, please um, already hit them in the chat and we can answer them now or later. So when software wise, we use now the training information, how the crypto exchange rate developed and we train multiple algorithms at the same time. So we, we used a bunch of, of algorithms because we were recognizing that sometimes one algorithm is better than performing than the other. So we trained the algorithm, we tested it with the last two weeks of data and said, would it work, have worked in the last two weeks? Then we used this information about the last two weeks, how it would have had performed. And then we fed it into a, a microservice that did the statistical action, that is analyzing, monitoring, and model health. So ultimately, that the complete training at that complete evaluation was running out as a Kafka stream. And then we had a coordinator service to do that. And there we collected the statistic, how healthy is that? So how, how good is the model performer performing? And ultimately, we used that this information to see if there is a combination of models that performs best because daytimes also differ. Um, and then to plug the models that are working best into, uh, into production and use them for uh, predicting cryptocurrencies. The thing is we had success rates to, to over 80% to predict the exchange rates. Um, it worked really, really well, in special for smaller cryptocurrencies um, because they were quite correlating to, to the Twitter messages. The problem is that the trading gap uh, was so large that we could not completely monetize on that. But um, these approaches uh, really work. The trade-off is that this is quite um, intense to train a lot of algorithms at the same time and brings you completely new challenges in training the, the models, then actively transferring them into um, the productive use. Um, because you then always have to copy the model because otherwise it will not work and so on and so forth. So uh, it takes a lot of resources, but it's an approach that works. So it's, you have the latest and greatest algorithms, but it's resource intensive. Solution two that we came up uh, for calibration features, and that was uh, in fact, in, in terms of public transport, because there we had a huge problem that the data was more sparse than in terms of cryptocurrency. What we did there is we, identified unpredictable events. So we said events in public transport like fairs, school holidays, um, all of that are unpredictable events because they are the same like COVID. Let's imagine we do not have an event calendar. Let's imagine we, we don't know that because when we know that then we are putting expert opinions into the system. So we, we quantified a, a piece of information to be not available to say that are unpredictable events. And we need to learn these unpredictable events as part of our journey. So we isolated features that are correlating to this unpredictable event. So we said, okay, there are infection rates. There are orthogonal features that have nothing to do with our data, 
or that are related to our data in a way that they're orthogonal to the other features. So we, we isolated as many features as we could find. And thereby we in special said, okay, is there a relation or a likely relation to the changing value to, to, the, to the concept drift that we have um, when, when, the, when the data changes, when the value just comes down by, by magnitude of 10 or 20, do we think that there could be a, a relation to this changing value? And then the second kind of feature that we searched was, is it relating one day to another? Is it relating one week to, to the last week? Is it uh, relating maybe an average to another? Because in the moment when it's, uh, when it's relating periods that it can be used for calibration. Um, and ultimately the idea was that we see that over that feature uh, a difference through the event. So it's implying um, that the event happened. So that means when a drop happens of numbers between today, yesterday, and the day before, and we have a three days trend um, and we have a short term trend, then there is a likely relation to the events. And it could be used for calibration. So then we had all of that features listed and you can do that in, in other projects too. And then with this um, independent features, we, we checked which are independent from another and which are uh, overloading another. So that means when we say what was last week, what was the average of the last month, they are not completely inde uh, independent. They have a relation to another. So we, we, we clustered them, which features are dependent and independent. And then we started to train uh, with the most generic independent features and, and identified their importance. And then we, when we saw effects, then we went deeper and used in this cluster of independent features, the more specific ones. So we have made them more fine grained then and to see their importance. So how does that look like? What are examples for that? We used normalization. So that means very often you have some models, uh, mathematical models, how you can say, how does the, the, the features change? So when we have an occupation, then it relates to another that we say, hey, normally um, there are five people, 10 people, 15 people in the bus, and maybe we, we can make that as buckets and then we make it uh, via five blocks. So, and then we can make a, a curve like the drop down, how many people are normally in there. And what we can do, we can use such a mathematical function like a distribution and so on um, of some value that you measure like, like the occupancy and try to distribute it over, uh, over a function. And then once you have it distributed over the function, you can use that function for normalization before you feed it into machine learning. And then once you have the uh, time series forecast, you can then denormalize it. There's one version to, to generate such a uh, calibration feature. Um, primarily, I mentioned the artist uh, relations to the day before, you can say the percentage to total. You can say the percentage to the last week. So um, when we started that, we thought originally a weekday would have a large impact, but um, you see here uh, in the chart down there that there is a percentage to the current total um, much more important than the weekday. Like said before, market polarity, um, is the market currently in a positive trend, in a negative trend? Slowly changing dimension past value comparison um, is what, how I, let's say, these examples of uh, to yesterday and so on. And the amount, that's also a very, very nice way um, to say, um, how many people tweeted positive of all people who tweeted. So always this relation, make it, make it in, in a calibrative way that you have a relation that kind of renders the situation independent. And these are the features that you need in, uh, in order to detect this, um, this unforeseen event, or let's say to calibrate your machine learning model um, out of 
features. So when you have a percentage, then this percentage can influence your model to scale it up or down when the things happen. And normally this would not be important, but you need to have data where the data really changes that your model then ultimately learns the calibration is a feature that it regularly uses. This has, um, let's say, the downside is it's cutting edge engineering that is great and it's brain intense. So you need to put a lot of effort. Let me sum that up therefore. What are the things that matter? What are concept drifts? Concept drifts are changes of the real world that are reflected in data that make our lives as data scientists miserable, where we have to find ways how to work away, uh, around that. The models need to be monitored. And I say that for each uh, machine learning model uh, project. When you develop AIs, we always think, oh, now we found the model. But this changes in data can happen. And even when you do not have the goal and it, it can happen and the model, model has a healthiness and it has a predictive factor or how good you can use it. And when you deploy a model in, in production, you need to know that one day it might not work anymore. And it's not the story that you say, ah, then we retrain it. No, because maybe it changes fundamentally and there need to be business processes defined what to do when you lose the predictive power or when resources business-wise are deployed to retrain the model. You cannot say, ah, oh, we, we just do that. When, when we think it's not working anymore, that's not good enough. So a model needs to be monitored and then there need to be escalation steps when it does not work anymore. So what do you do about concept drifts? I've proposed to you um, two different things what you can do. You have uh, active intelligent models updates uh, with online learning or uh, where you really train them in production. That is resource intense, but I, I really like it because I like engineering solutions. Or secondly, you use calibrating features and you engineer them. That is something that I like as, as brain sports a lot. But um, it comes at a cost to, to do and to predict concept drifts comes at a cost. It's, um, it's an added effort and one needs to be truthful about that. So I'm always on the search. Maybe you can give me your examples for concept drifts. That would be really awesome. Just ping me via email, ping it in the chat. I'm always searching examples of other people experience the, the concepts. And do you have experiences with concept drifts and what were there? Write in the chat or ping me an email later. I always like that for my future presentations to learn more there. So I thank you already in advance. And with that, um, I'm curious for your questions, what you have to say. And I thank you for your attention. Yeah, please, if you have any questions, you can either write in the chat or to any session. I think it was very clear presentation so that people don't ask and they stay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I hope so. I hope so. You, you never know if it was too much, too less. So if somebody comes up later with questions, please always be free to reach out to me because um, I have recognized that there is a lot of interest in the topic and I'm always um, curious for other use cases than the ones that are, we have seen. Oh, yeah, the crypto predictions. Yeah, if that would have worked, I would not be here needing to do the talk. Um, why did the crypto predictions not work? Um, the thing is, there is a gap. When you, when you buy uh, sh shares on, or cryptos, it does not matter. You always have to buy at the, at bit, you have a bid and a, you have an ask rate. So you always make a loss when you buy in. So you have to, to, to have that gap 
what you bought in and what you can sell for in the next minute. So, and the thing is, uh, this gap is your loss that you do at the beginning. And then you have to overcome this gap. And that is fine. We were able to overcome the gap. But what we were not able to overcome was the commission of the exchange because we always also had to pay the exchange. So when we had to pay the exchange, that was, uh, that was too much um, to do that. And that was the key problem in the, in the crypto exchanges because in the moment when we had the too long time period to forecast, this market there is changing quite rapidly, then our risk factor that our predictions will fail so the, the likelihood that the predictions are right was coming down and the, this trade-off was not there um, compared to the commission and the gap that we were certain to make, uh, to make a secure trade. It was then all together, it was under a likelihood of 50%, but the exchange rate prediction uh, was really, really high. So sadly that um, did not work. But if you are curious, I have a talk about that, then I can share that talk with you. Um, that's possible. There is a question in Q&A. Yeah. Well, thank you, Lauren. There are good examples, the real-time bidding. I worked once on the project. I didn't come up with that, right? Thank you. So, is there a good way to take the concept change? Um, you can use. Um, James Liu, you ask how to detect the concept change. Um, yeah, you see, first, the second question, how to see if it's no longer useful, you test it with actual data. And if you have too many fails with the actual data, you know that it's not uh, not working anymore. Normally what you see, it's, it's going down over weeks because the concepts are there. It's, it's rarely that you have that, um, let's say the Corona hit where, where it's quite intense. So normally it's, um, it's coming down over weeks and that you see that each week you have lesser, lesser correct hits or the accuracy is lower. Um, sometimes you have the direct hits from Corona and how to detect it. What you also can do is you can use anomaly uh, detection. We are currently doing testing with that. If anomaly detection can be used to indicate there's a drift, but I do not have evidence so far. There is no concrete way that I know of how to predict it, uh, how to see the concept change before it happens. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I, it's a great presentation and people can reach out to you from LinkedIn as well and can also send us an email. I appreciate your time and everyone's time here. Uh, it's, it's a great talk and you can watch this on YouTube later. Okay, good. Um, okay, uh, wait there. Perfect. I'm just seeing the last questions there. Um, Randall, let's take that offline. Just ping me. Um, that's the easiest. Um, uh, the config architecture, Paul. That's also too too uh, too complicated to answer that uh, quickly. You can ping me for that. Also, I'm I'm sorry about that. So, okay, good. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>